And now, the President on whom the sun is setting will address the Assembly. Your Excellency Philemon Yang, President-elect of the General Assembly at its 79th session, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I stand before you this morning one last time in my capacity as President of the General Assembly at its 78th session, a role that has been for me the honor and privilege of a lifetime. I could not have fulfilled this awesome responsibility without the trust, support, and generosity of many to whom I will forever remain deeply indebted. Foremost, I extend my deepest gratitude to the government of Trinidad and Tobago for their trust and confidence in sending forth a nomination for this office in my name. Trinidad and Tobago, a small island nation I'm immensely proud to call home, has been pivotal to my education and career advancement, and, I will, and will remain at the heart of my endeavors whatever they may be, in the years ahead. I also wish to express my sincere gratitude to all the nations of my region, the group of Latin American and Caribbean states, and to the Caribbean community, CARICOM, for their kind and faithful endorsement of my candidature and for their steadfast support throughout my tenure. While I hope I have made my country and indeed my region proud, it was never lost on me that this was, in fact, a global mandate, necessitating that I discharge this responsibility with the utmost commitment to serve all member states with impartiality and equidistance, with equal measure as president. During my tenure, I endeavored to ensure that my guiding vision and its underpinning principles were firmly rooted in the Charter of the United Nations and the oath of office I took one year ago. It has been my great privilege and indeed pleasure to have worked closely and collaboratively with our distinguished visionary Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Gutierrez whose boundless devotion to UN ideals and principles and to the practical realization of the promise of the United Nations stand out as an example of true faith in multilateralism. I should like to thank him most sincerely for his exceptional leadership and for our very pleasant and candid exchanges during which I benefited from his wisdom and experience. We all know that it is all too simplistic to regard the presidency of the General Assembly as a one-person show, not a one-man show, not a one-woman show, but a one-person show. And so it would be quite remiss of me not to acknowledge the invaluable contribution and indeed to extend my deepest appreciation to my dedicated multinational team that comprised the office of the president during the 78th session. This team, carefully chosen with due attention to both gender parity and geographical representation, afforded steady and tireless hands in diligently advancing the work of my office 
with great professionalism, dedication, and strong team spirit. I wish to thank in particular my chef du cabinet, Ambassador Colin Vixen Kilepile, and my deputy chef du cabinet, Inga Canciavelli, whose expertise and effective management of the team was instrumental in ensuring that the office rose to the occasion during a session marked by extraordinary challenges. Allow me to also take this opportunity to say how deeply appreciative I am to, the, excuse me, to those member states, the preponderant majority of whom are from the Global South, for their generous secondment of staff to my team. And they are Algeria, Azerbaijan, China, Equatorial Guinea, Estonia, India, Indonesia, Germany, Libya, the Maldives, Mauritania, Namibia, the Netherlands, the state of Qatar, Saudi Arabia, St. Kitts and Nevis, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago, and Vietnam, as well as Japan for providing support for the retention of a capable diplomat. The officer's mandate would not have been achievable without the contributions generally provide, generously provided to the trust fund, including to finance the OPGA fellowship program. Let me also express my sincere appreciation to the general committee membership, to the chairs of the main committees, co-facilitators and co-chairs of this session, as well as to my vice presidents who supported the work of my office and often stepped in when conflicting commitments summoned me to attend to other matters. Excellencies, I hope you would agree with me, with my assessment, that it has certainly been an eventful 78th session. We began the session in September with an especially hectic, though successful high-level week featuring the SDG Summit and high-level dialogue on financing for development, as well as a number of other significant achievements for multilateral diplomacy. In its very first resolution adopted during the session, the General Assembly endorsed the landmark political declarations adopted by leaders at the SDG Summit. The Assembly reaffirmed our shared commitment to end poverty and hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities within and among countries, and to build peaceful societies that leave no one behind. Additional political declarations followed on universal health care, pandemic prevention and preparedness and response, and the fight against tuberculosis, raising the ambition even higher to make progress on critical global health issues. I am pleased that the progress delivered during High Level Week was further built upon by the first ever UNGA Sustainability Week, a flagship initiative of my presidency. Held last April, this week consolidated several high-level events into a single compact period focused impactfully on sustainability with the aim of galvanizing momentum ahead of the summit of the future, a pivotal moment when world leaders will soon gather here in New York to inject fresh energy into our multilateral system. Beyond these high-level achievements, I am much gratified by our efforts to advance the priority of gender equality. This includes the re-establishment of the Advisory Board on Gender Equality and the work accomplished with my special advisor on gender equality and women's empowerment, Ambassador Keisha Maguire, whom I thank for ensuring that all major initiatives and messagings, messaging in the OPGA were consistently aligned with a strong focus on gender. I am especially heartened by our success 
in achieving gender parity among speakers and panelists at the General Assembly meetings. And we must strive to ensure that this remains a consistent feature moving forward into the 79th session and beyond. The wise counsel and cooperation I receive from my board of advisors on least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states helps to highlight the legitimate concerns of exceptionally vulnerable member states in General Assembly discussions and beyond. My now popular, if only by name, GAYAP dialogues assisted immensely in fostering trust and solidarity among member states and provided a platform to address pressing global issues and facilitate open exchanges beyond the constraints of formal UN meetings. The spirited debates of these dialogues led to concrete out outcomes, such as the informal consultation I convened ahead of the drafting of the Security Council's annual report. I take great satisfaction in having continued the OPGA fellowship program this year, providing young diplomats from six underrepresented countries the opportunity to work within the UN system and to gain hands-on experience in multilateralism. It is my sincere hope that they will use this experience to enrich their diplomatic careers and to enhance their nation's effective participation in multilateral negotiations. Excellencies, a key aspect of the work of the Office of President of the General Assembly is ensuring our relevance to all eight billion global constituents. To that end, I visited 31 countries, engaging not only with heads of state and government, but also with a wide range of stakeholders students, young people, parliamentarians, civil society organizations, women's groups, community leaders, refugees, and forcibly dis displaced populations. During these visits, I witnessed firsthand the remarkable and impactful work being delivered by UN country teams sometimes in difficult circumstances. We owe a debt of gratitude to our frontline operatives, who despite budgetary constraints, constraints and other frustrations, proudly and selfless, selflessly fly the UN flag, bringing much needed relief, hope, and support to missions around the world, including the dispossessed, and marginalized. I made it a priority to connect with youth and civil society on these visits. These interactions provided valuable insights into the diverse perspectives and expectations for the future of our multilateral system. My visits to Haiti, South Sudan, and Ukraine were especially poignant as these nations are facing conflict, insecurity, and aggression. The UN's effort in these regions are truly life-saving, and I conveyed a message of solidarity and unwavering support, which was well received. While circumstances frustrated my desire to meet with Israelis and Palestinians on the ground, in the vicinity of the theater of ongoing action, developments there remained uppermost in my mind, and I have discussed that situation with every relevant leader, including His Holiness Pope Francis. It is my sincere hope that ongoing efforts will produce a ceasefire, even if temporary, and this can somehow lead to a political process towards achieving long-lasting peace for the sake of the peoples of the region. Excellencies, from the start of the 78th session, 
a central theme guided my presidency, rebuilding trust and reigniting global solidarity, accelerating action on the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals towards peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability for all. These four pillars, peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability, encapsulate the essential priorities of our collective work. Among them, peace holds the foremost position, not just as a guiding principle, but as the very raison d'etre, the alpha and omega, if you will, of the United Nations. It constitutes the very core of our brand. This organization was forged in the fires of two cataclysmic wars with the solemn vow of sparing future generations from the scourge of war. The United Nations must rise to meet this highest calling and fulfill its mandate to maintain international peace and security as conflicts proliferate from Ukraine to Haiti, to the Middle East, and to Africa. It is no understatement to say that the magnitude of man-made human suffering we are witnessing around the world is simply staggering. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the Gaza Strip. Over the course of last year, we have witnessed a scale of death and destruction not seen in decades. I continue my call for the full implementation of GA resolutions, and in that regard, reiterate the General Assembly's call for both a ceasefire and the immediate and unconditional release of all remaining hostages. In the same vein, in line with relevant General Assembly resolutions, I urge the Russian Federation to comply with international law by abandoning its aggression against Ukraine. During the 78th session, the General Assembly continued and indeed heightened its activism in holding the Security Council accountable, including by its full implementation of the veto initiative, which brought much needed transparency ensuring that the voices of member states in the elected chamber are heard when the Security Council is paralyzed due to the use of the veto. In furtherance of our efforts, my office recently launched the digital handbook as mandated by GA Resolution 77 stroke 335. This resource offers a wealth of information on the Assembly's past actions in respect of matters of peace and security, serving as an invaluable guide for future endeavors. We must build on this momentum and continue to fulfill our mission for peace. As we do so, we must remember that peace without human rights is no peace at all. Human rights are a cross-cutting issue and in their absence, conflict, strife, and injustice will thrive. This reflection is especially poignant in this session, which marked the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It reminds us of the visceral importance of human rights and reaffirms our commitment to promoting and protecting them all around the world. On a subject close to my heart, I engaged in challenging, though illuminating, discussions with member states on reparatory justice in the context of my Gaia dialogues. As a native of Trinidad and Tobago, and as a member of the Caribbean community, this issue resonates deeply with me. I encourage the permanent forum on people of African descent to openly confront our history by continuing these discussions in hopeful anticipation of the proclamation of a second international decade with a clear focus on reparatory justice, recognition, and equity. 
Regarding equity, I am pleased that arrangements have been made with the UN Secretariat to ensure that once finalized, the Pact of the Future and its annexes will be issued as a fully accessible document. This is absolutely necessary given their importance and the need to ensure inclusivity and broad accessibility to UN materials. Excellencies, the second pillar I chose was prosperity, a fundamental human aspiration. The desire to build a better life for themselves and their families motivates people across the world. Yet millions still live in abject poverty and hopelessness, enduring the indignities of deprivation and want. On our current trajectory, millions will face poverty and hunger in 2030. Again, the most vulnerable are disproportionately affected, especially those in LDCs, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states. Many of these countries are trapped in debilitating debt cycles, forced to make impossible choices between meeting immediate socioeconomic needs and planning for the future, and are exceptionally vulnerable to the ravages of climate-induced disasters. It is time to focus squarely on financing for development and move beyond GDP per capita as the sole measure of a country's economic health. This is especially relevant for nations that must constantly divert scarce resources to address sudden shocks. Meaningfully addressing the problem and consequences of debt is essential. We must therefore strive to attain debt sustainability. To that end, I was pleased that the, by the General Assembly's recent approval of the Multidimensional Vulnerability Index. This is a critical step forward to a more equitable and accurate assessment of vulnerability, guiding international support to where it is most needed. The third pillar is progress. We live in an era of remarkable advancements, the future beckoning us forth at dizzying speed. The world is undergoing unprecedented transformations driven by revolutions in artificial intelligence, digital technology, and scientific innovation. These transformational breakthroughs hold the promise of a better tomorrow, offering enhanced standards of living and welfare for everyone, everywhere, but only, only if progress along this path is inclusive. The benefits cannot be confined to a privileged few. They must be shared by all. Yet significant disparities persist particularly in access to these powerful tools of progress. Gender and wealth inequalities continue to widen divides, including digital divides, leaving billions without the means to tr truly thrive in the 21st century. Finally, sustainability is the linchpin of our global efforts, the watchword that binds all others together. For any advancement in peace, prosperity, or progress to be truly meaningful, it must also address the question of sustainability. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was imbued with immense hope and offered comprehensive, measurable targets to help the global community achieve its highest aspirations. Disappointingly, our lofty ambitions have been met 
with a sluggish pace of progress. We are far off track in meeting the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. These goals are not mere abstractions. They bear profound implications for our people and our planet. And if we do not meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target established in the Paris Climate Agreement, millions in vulnerable situations around the world will suffer the devastating effects of climate change. Climate action dictates that we do not ignore the fact that August 2024 was the hottest month on record. Rising sea levels threatened to inundate small island developing states and low-lying coastal communities, displacing millions, posing real threats to livelihood, heritage, and identity. Issues leaders will address in depth during the upcoming high-level meeting on sea level rise on 25th September. Floods, hurricanes, drought, and other disasters are proliferating, and the window to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of global warming is rapidly closing. Excellency, sustainability is the thread that connects all aspects of our work. It ensures that the foundation we lay today will support a stable, just, and thriving world for generations to come. Let us all, therefore, individually and collectively, choose sustainability and recommit ourselves to this most critical endeavor, for it is only through sustainability that we can secure the future of our shared planet. If there is one final message, message I wish to leave with you, it is this. While the challenges we face may be complex, they are certainly not beyond our capacity to overcome. Together, acting in unison, we can create the outcomes we need to build a secure and prosperous future. Indeed, we have a joint responsibility to confront the challenges, so we must use every tool at our disposal. The most powerful, the most effective, and perhaps the most uh, compelling is the multilateral system. I am deeply convinced that this institution, the United Nations, remain one of the greatest forces for good in the world. And that we must work hard to sustain its longevity. This conviction has been strengthened throughout my long career in diplomacy and during the eventful 78th session of the assembly. It is the same conviction I see in the faces of colleagues, dignitaries, civil society, indigenous and young people, and all those who believe in the value of our fundamental mandate to serve and lift up we the peoples. Let us rise to the occasion. Let us deliver on the promises we have made. And let us work together in solidarity to build a future that honors the hopes and dreams of all peoples and truly unites the nations. These aspirations are undoubtedly ambitious, but I am confident that with shared courage, resolve, and the requisite political will, we can and will succeed. As the great Nelson Mandela once said, 
It always seems impossible until it is done. Finally, I close by expressing my grateful thanks to the entire General Assembly for affording me this rare honor and for your very fulsome support and cooperation over the last year. I extend my best wishes for success to His Excellency Philomen Yang, the President-elect of the 79th session and his team. I expect that under his leadership, the General Assembly will continue to advance our shared goals and meet the challenges ahead with wisdom and resolve. Allow me to extend my deepest appreciation to my wife, Joy, without whose patience, understanding, and encouragement. Let me read that again. Allow me to extend my deepest appreciation to my wife, Joy, whose patience, understanding, and encouragement freed me to concentrate on delivering the job of president. As I yield the presidency to my distinguished colleague, I do so with a heart full of gratitude and hope for a better and brighter future for all, without exception, everywhere. Thank you.